Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Write America. Uh, Write America is our literary series that is spearheaded by author Roger Rosenblatt uh, in an effort to bridge the great divide in our country through readings and conversations from award-winning, nationally renowned, and new and emerging uh, writers. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'll be your host for this evening. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with um, our bookstore, Book Review, uh, we are Long Island's largest independent bookstore located in Huntington Village. Uh, I am so thrilled to be back here with you guys uh, tonight um, for another episode of Write America. Tonight we have uh, Carlos Fonseca and Rose Styron with us. Um, they're going to be sharing some readings and conversation. Uh, but if you missed uh, last week's episode with uh, the fabulous Paul Oster and Siri Kuspet, uh, you can go uh, to Book Review's Crowdcast channel at any time to watch the recordings. Uh, every episode of Write America is recorded, uh, as will this one. Uh, this one's also going to be recorded, so you can, uh, if you miss anything, you can just go back and check that out. Um, now, before we get started with the readings, there's a few things that I'd like to show you about Crowdcast, just in case this is your first time here with us tonight. Um, right below the stream, there is a blue button. If you click that button, it will bring you to bookreview.com, where you can purchase uh, books um, signed by all of the Right America authors. Um, there is an Ask a Question button down here also somewhere. Uh, if you click that button, you can submit a question for Carlos and Rose uh, for the uh, Q&A that we're going to get to at the end of the event here. Um, and then there is also the chat. Feel free um, to chat amongst yourselves. Uh, comment on the readings and the conversation. You can, you know, ask questions in there too. And of course, drop your emoji applause. Um, and I think that's pretty much it that covers all of the bases. So we are going to get on with the readings. Uh, so our first reader tonight is Rose Styron. Uh, Rose is a poet, journalist, translator, <clears throat> and international human rights activist. She's published four volumes of poetry and traveled widely for Amnesty International and other human rights organizations, chairing AIUSA's National Advisory Council, Penn's Freedom to Write Committee, and the RFK Human Rights Award. In 2009 and 2010, Rose was a resident fellow at Harvard University of Politics and its Carr Center for Human Rights. More recently, with Meryl Streep, she co-chaired Poetry and the Creative Mind on stage at Lincoln Center on behalf of the American Academy of, uh, Academy of American Poets, excuse me. Uh, so please welcome our first reader, Rose Styron. Hi, Rose. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, so glad you could be here with us tonight. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> I think since, a, I guess I should put my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> I will leave you to it. But I thought since Carlos and I uh, both agreed uh, that nature was our inspiration initially for writing prose and poetry, um, even though we've all been uh, involved, uh, each of us, with many of other uh, causes, whether it was human rights or climate change in this complex age of violence and lying, I thought maybe, you know, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. And so I decided just to read poems about the beauty that informs me on Martha's Vineyard, which is now, uh, after a long life, my permanent home. Um, so I decided to make choices from my last two books of poetry, 20 years apart, I must say, by Vineyard Light and Fierce Day. And um, the earlier ones were written sort of in times of, you know, romance and family and marriage and children. And these last in my older, more solitary days reflecting. So I'll just start in with poems about Martha's Vineyard. No one's awake but us and a bird, the days too beautiful to speak a word. This antique landscape rubbed by hand shines through the mist like silvered hay. Its hewn rail fence, grade barn, sweet fields, 
where dusty birds hide, startled, focus day. April woke our island, white pear trees bloom and bloom along Clough Lane through Sunday rain. Does God hear church bells chime? Is he asleep as we have been? Let spring's alarms remind all we've not done to clear the sun and purify the land. Alarms beyond such beauty sound. Dead mallards on our lawn? No roses after violent storms? Entangled fish? Dark smoke trails form where child-drawn clouds moved on. May's comedy. These fresh green boughs mask broken fence and shattered limbs of maples, elms. We smile, applaud such chance to sally forth again, again, surviving one more hurricane, counting now each blossom, wing beat, timed as citizen voices sing, soar, and descend a tone. There is a moment in May when Quince and John Quill turn the lawn into a color mart. Attractions for each age, a stand for old desires. Andromeda poses by the yew, the fortune of Forsythia hovers where tulip darts, their target missed, stick in the ground. And early apple blossoms beckon precarious for us as the stone-piled wall. It is a moment, petaled, lighting as we light from the past to bless us dark and far on our many, mind, on our many winds way. And this is the beginning of a long poem called Wedding Prelude. Uh, when our son Tom and his bride Phoebe were about to be married on the vineyard as others of our children were. And I stood at Brookside Farm in the morning before the wedding. I'll just read the first few stanzas of this. At Brookside Farm, the oxen graze, tilting their horns as harriers glide aslant the wind homeward. The weathered ox cart unused rests against the welcome barn. At Brookside Farm, the oxen graze not from dark hollowed sockets, mouths agape at ongoing Guernicas. No masters hanged from the roadside cross. No choir boys hidden in chestnut trees, leaves of midsummer plunging all around them. No skies spray ash or blackened rivers boneful overflow. At Brookside Farm, the oxen graze on dappled horses, roan graze, munching the feathered hillside. Their gilded tails swap flies, remembered stars. From great veranda chairs, the cats uncurl, lions yawning in their wicker lairs. As I walk by a greener century, the tumbled birdhouse half-tamed pastures, theirs. This is looking at the painted screen our artist Kib Bramhall devised. 
through Chinese screens, rosewood, and the pale fabric we call sky, a pure white heron over the water doubles our reflection. The artist is responsible for God, responsible to man. And moving on to summer. Good night, great summer sky, world of my childhood and the star-struck sea. White shades from that ancestral southern porch, my raft. White goose down quilt, my ballast. Under Orion, on our green waved lawn, I float high, new moon, old craft, tied strong as ever to the sheer horizon. Over the seawall on the dock, Andromeda, their strict and jeweled guard, as tall Orion seas and lawns ago was mine, chose to be mine. Our children sleep, Alexandra, Tom, under their folded goose wing sails, true friends in dream, the folly wrangle of their sibling day outshone by starlight. Calm island evening, never ending sea, our lovers rages too are quiet drowned. Miracle of midsummer, the trust of dark sails us beyond this harbor. And here is one of my many, many trips to the beaches of Martha's Vineyard. This goes to Zach's Cliffs. The lure of South Beach on a beautiful day, the crest of September, snow's kingdom, December, blue windward and leeward in May. The lure that the curlew and sanderling know of wildness and bluster, of limbo and luster, sun chasing the tail of the blow when life is intense or contentious in town, too calm at the harbor, too rich by the arbor, the lawn in this heat turning brown, the lure like a rainbow he claimed there should be, storm cast to tease us, catches us, frees us, Come, love, let us race to the sea. But all is not beautiful entirely. Each crisp autumn, there are fewer leaves, more clarity, light cycles of the hay mound, odors of late roses, rivers, rushing where we once meandered, content in the casual chaos of each season, plotting no espionage because we did not know the world as terror then. I took many wonderful birding and wildlife trips with Peter Matheson, Victor Emanuel, and many friends, and went so many wonderful wild places. But one of my very last trips with Peter was to Belize, a strange trip it was. The mysterious forests Cecropia, palm, their enchanted creatures of shade, deep 
vine wound paths, mud python roots, spiked crowns the bromeliads made, awaiting the moon or a skittering bird. Dark loves, but no more for me. The passions of age are for lupine fields, sun's road, and a shorebird sea. This will be my last poem. You would have loved today, this twilight, high in the wild fever, spring bruised field. Straight young lilacs stand at the edge and hidden sentries in the cattail stalks and buttercup, daisy, Queen Anne's lace in the stray breeze nodding. Rim of the heart, first red-winged blackbird calls in the tall sycamore. A pair of bluebirds swings in the windy elm. Polly is dancing, arms high, head back, as the hawk she has deemed her father glides and bows, mirroring her from his sky-blown sky. The birds of twilight sing your songs, wait in your silver cloud map for my knowing. Okay. So that was so beautiful. I'm so glad you read that last one. That was my favorite. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you so much. So we'll see you a little bit later for the conversation. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so up next, we have a reading from Mr. Carlos Fonseca. Uh, Carlos was born in San Jose, Costa Rica, and spent half of his life or half of his childhood and adolescence in Puerto Rico. In 2016, he was named one of the 20 best Latin American writers born in the 1980s at the Guadalajara Book Fair. And in 2017, he was included in the Bogota 39 list of the best Latin American writers under 40. He is the author of the novels, Colonel Lagrimas and Natural History. And in 2018, he was awarded the National Prize for Literature in Costa Rica for his book of essays, La Lucides del Miope. Broadcasting all the way from London, please welcome Carlos Fonseca. Hi, Carlos. Hey, Lauren, how are you? <laughs> Hello. Uh, so glad you could um, be here with us tonight. I'm very I'm excited so to hear what you're going to read. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks so much, Lauren, and thanks so much to Book Review. And of course, to Roger Rosenblatt for having this amazing initiative of uh, Write America. I think it's much needed right now. And of course, to my very good friend, Claudia uh, Acevedo Quinones, who originally suggested to Roger that I would be somebody uh, of interest that I think I saw Claudia around. So yeah, she's tuning amazing. in tonight. Yeah, <laughs> so that was really nice to be in like, you know, company. So yeah, I'll just follow up and like, you know, what Rose has been reading and like, you know, uh, develop a little bit this topic of nature. Of course, I will leave you to it. <laughs> Thanks so much. So, so yeah, like following up on like Rose's beautiful poems, which uh, I think would not be more timely here in London where I am, like we're just uh, getting out of like lockdown after five months. So I thought that it would be nice to, to continue that kind of vibe of, uh, you know, arrival of April, continuation and progression to, to summer. And in that regard, I thought that I could read from my latest novel, Natural History, which was translated by my great accomplice, Megan McDowell, who has translated other amazing Latin American authors that I really recommend for all of you. Authors like Lina Meruane, Samantha Schwerlin, Maria Enriquez, and Alejandro Zambra. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll read a little bit from a passage which deals with nature. This is basically a novel that has also to do with like, you know, that very broad 
notion of America, right? And that conversation between the two Americas that we could like speak about, right? Like the America without the accent and the America with the accent, the, the conversation between basically North and South. And uh, in the novel, there is a family and that family kind of like gets tired of like the glamorous life in, you know, up North in the New York and decides to take a pilgrimage down South throughout the, the Latin American nature. And um, the passage I'm just gonna read kind of like traces the beginning of that trip uh, through the lens of the father who is a, a fashion photographer that is brought into the trip to kind of document photographically that trip. And kind of like, you know, following up on like what Rose was saying, I think that, um, um, you know, nature is a place that for America has always been a space of projections, of desires, even since Christopher Columbus, right? And sometimes the desires and the projections and the fantasies that we project upon nature are not quite, you know, what we find. So that's a little bit the sort of disappointment um, that is being traced in, in these pages. So I'll just go ahead and read. Um, For uh, moments at a time in the landscape's populous calm, the only thing that can be heard is the camera as it flashes. For that instant, all that exists is him, the camera, and the impression that will be left to a future he can't see, but on which he has bet it all. For that instant, nothing exists but him and his belief, him and his future. Then, gradually, bringing him back to the jungle, the sonata of the rolling tropics filters in. The cacophony of birds, the fluttering of uncaged chickens, the snore of a tired native, the hiccup of some drunken Englishman. Still farther off, in a terribly singular and painful space, the sobs of the daughter whose cries he now hears again. Only then does he take his eye from the camera and look at her. Just 10 years old, she has the heavy gaze of an insomniac and a terrible pallor that makes him think of Nordic latitudes he's never seen. Besides the girl, a forcefully beautiful woman soothes her with a hand he knows well. With her hand, his wife labors over a small red leather notebook, the same one in which 10 years, 10 days earlier, she wrote, day one, the journey begins. Only 10 days and already the trip feels long, heavy, routine. 10 days have passed since a rusted out bus left them on the threshold of what they dare to call a jungle, but that at times seems like nothing more than a giant garbage dump left behind an absentee god. He's distracted by the grunting rumble of a pig as he delves into the garbage. And then he takes in the full scene that's around him. The couple of drunken Brits to one side, finishing off a bottle of gold rum. The atmosphere of lethargy and siesta over which a team in nature looms superimposed. The drugged out German restaging his theatrical monologue for a laughing group of natives. The rest of the pilgrims sporadically dot the scene, resting on their small tin roofs where the last drops of water drum a monotonous beat. And beyond, a man with tired eyes and unusual strength returns to his indecipherable prayer. Ten days have passed since this man, in his rough voice and unplaceable accent, promised them that by month's end they would reach the young seer. They call him the Apostle. His arms are tattooed with symbols of war and over a dozen plastic rosaries hang around his neck. His voice is hoarse, withdrawn. His speech is like a delusional monologue, a private and endless prayer to fill the empty hours. Gringo Maldito, the natives call him behind his back. He refuses to say a word to them. Even so, five of them go everywhere with him. It's rumored that he came in search of drugs and then found out he could never go back. It's rumored that he comes from a moneyed family and that when he was young, he showed promise in the theater. It's rumored that enlightenment came to him decades ago in the midst of the jungle, besides the immense tree he claims to be guiding them toward. They call him the apostle because that's what he calls himself. They call him the apostle, but sometimes the pilgrims have the feeling he's nothing but a tour guide, a drugged Virgil for a credulous man. Still, 
You only have to look again or listen to him in his endless prayer to know that he, at least, believes in everything he has promised. Now, three stinking pigs meander around him in the mud, while further on, the natives played cards to, read, to ride out the boredom. They all wear American brand names and the ironic expressions of unbelievers. They all, natives and pilgrims alike, call him the apostle because he promises things. Ten days ago, for example, he promised them that in one month's time they would come to an enormous archipelago in the middle of the jungle, and then there, at the foot of a great fallen tree, the seer will show them the way. In his eyes, somewhere between belief and madness, the gamble of a generation is made manifest. Ten days have passed since they started their journey on food, five since the little girl started to get sick. The whole time, the jungle has done nothing but contradict their expectations. The naked natives wear t-shirts with rock band logos. In the place of exuberant nature, there are garbage dumps. Instead of lawlessness, the state is omnipresent. Everywhere they go, they encounter police, solemn border agents who fight their own boredom by assiduously checking travel documents. Far from the paradise they dreamt of, the jungle reveals its more modern face, its ruinous border down face. Nevertheless, they well, they know, well know that nature is there, latent like a sleeping scorpion. They sense it at night in the utter darkness that envelops them. They hear it rather than see it in the whisper of nighttime animals, the fluttering fowl, the croak of the frogs like nocturnal birds, the murmur of the insects always poised to wage war against the mosquito net. He, however, has been tasked specifically with making nature visible. As a photographer, he is to document the trip. That's his place, halfway between participation and observation, between belief and irony. Only five years earlier, he, he earned his living taking photos of the most coveted models of New York. Today, he's following a man who has made an impossible promise. He's chasing after a drugged man's invisible dream. So that's it. Hey, Rose. How are you? So lovely Hi. to see you again. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> you Thanks. Well. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. And we have so much in common, right? Like before we were speaking and uh, we have so many anecdotes, Latin American <laughs> anecdotes that uh, <laughs> we share in unexpected ways, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It was wonderful for, for me. Uh, I think I started telling you about this funny dinner party uh, that we had, you you wanted me to talk, talk about that. <laughs> I think it's amazing. Um, and that leads to a question. The question I'm asking you um, after I tell the story, or you could tell me first, is what um, writer or writers most influenced you and inspired you to write when you were young? And the reason I'm asking you this is because I had this funny dinner party. Bill Styron and I had this funny dinner party, very impromptu, when we got a call from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who I had known because we had written back-to-back -back, uh, pieces during Pinochet's coup in Chile, and then we had been on a panel together in Mexico. Uh, and I won't go into all of that, but he called me. I hadn't seen him for a few years. And he called me at 11 o'clock one night and said, you always said I should come to the vineyard. Uh, Carlos Fuentes is coming up as usual to visit you in about two weeks. Should I come with him? And I said, of course, that would be just great. And he said, well, I'll call you next week and let you know. And 12 hours later on a beach on Martha's Vineyard, um, President Clinton, who was uh, there that summer with Hillary, said to me, I hear Carlos Fuentes is coming to visit you. Um, he's my daughter Chelsea's favorite author. Chelsea was 13, I think. I was quite impressed. Would you please invite us over when he comes? So 
I said, sure, wondering how on earth he knew at that point that, you know, that Gabo might come and visit. So a couple of weeks later, he came, Carlos Fuentes came, uh, the foreign minister of Mexico, whom I didn't know, came, etc. We had a long table set for dinner. And after um, Gabo had been peppering um, President Clinton with questions and uh, urging him to lift the sanctions mm -hmm. on Cuba, uh, the subject luckily got changed because there were a lot of writers there. And uh, we asked what uh, writer or what book inspired you most uh, when you were young. And we got lots of different answers uh, from Don Quixote forward. And when it got through the writers and came to uh, President Clinton, who was on my right, he pushed his chair back and said, well, my favorite author is Faulkner. I'm a Southern boy, he said. And he got up and walked around our table three or four times reciting Benji's monologue from The Sound and the Fury, word for word, which was a great start until dessert came. But we all stayed friends and we visited um, the Fuentes every uh, New Year's or after New Year's in Mexico and they visited us on the vineyard and um, I, it took me when I was um, with Penn trying to get Gabo uh, sorry Garcia Marquez um, a visa uh, to the United States which took several years to get because they thought he was um, Castro's pal and a revolutionary and our government courtesy of Kissinger and others was trying to get rid of Castro as you remember and so he finally came in and came up to New York City and we had a great time together and he said I want to uh, go south and go to Faulkner's home because he's my favorite author and this was long before I learned that he was also Clinton's favorite author. And uh, the American government wouldn't let him go. They said, oh, no, you, you can't leave New York City. But a few years later, when all that changed, we had some Democrats in the White House. Um, he did get to go south. Ooh. Democrats to honor who, Faulkner. who were reading Faulkner, right? So that's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> So did you have any American, uh, you know, writers that you felt that way about? And and I'd like to know the Latin American ones, too. Yeah. Well, first of all, I see people in the crowd are saying, like, I would like to have been at that party. I would like I would have loved to be at that party as well. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. And I and, you know, like the anecdote that you say with regards to like Bill Clinton is amazing because I bet that in that same moment, everybody forgot about politics and what all of the Latin American writers wanted to hog Bill Clinton <laughs> because he chose the perfect answer. Like Faulkner, I think, lies at the very heart of the Latin American tradition. Like, if you huh. think about all of these authors, like that were like central for the Latin American boom, right? Like, but Gaciosa was reading Faulkner. I think we talked a bit before about like you know, Light in August being like the novel oh, right. that like he always mentions, and then like, of course, Carlos Fuentes and Garcia Marquez himself. Like, you know, he did the pilgrimage to you know, to Oxford, Mississippi. So like he definitely thought that like oh, Faulkner was at the very heart of it. And for me as well, like I think like, you know, I began reading all of them, right? So huh. all of these authors that were there were, you know, our, our canon, right? The Latin American boom or like the authors that we, you know, read. And indirectly you always, they lead you to Faulkner and then you encounter kind of the master of it all which is somebody who has like a lot to say also about America, right? And like that, like, you know, very long history of colonialism of like, you know, like oh, the, yeah. that led to all of these divisions that, that we are now like, you know, ex living through. And I think that like, you know, returning to Faulkner 
might be one way of like understanding like our current day like you know problems like to think that Faulkner led to Garcia Marquez and to Toni Morrison is just <laughs> lovely right oh, absolutely that's so interesting I remember w one other thing that Clinton said and I'm ashamed to say it's a writer I've never read he after Faulkner he said by the way, I've just been reading Paco Taibo. Ah, Paco and, Taibo. And, and both um, uh, Fuentes and Garcia Marquez said, Paco, we just had dinner with him, you know, last week. We didn't know any Americans read him. Oh, that's amazing. It looks like Bill Clinton was winning the hearts of the, of the Latin American <laughs> writers. Uh, so that's uh that's lovely yeah yeah so yeah in my case you know uh something that happens with all of us is a little bit like you know these these authors are such towering figures like authors like garcia marquez vargas llosa and carlos fuentes particularly also cortazar that at one point like when you're 19 or 20 you have to kind of like begin to like differentiate what you do with respect to them, right? Like that's that's normal, right? <laughs> you, you need to be cool like that. And the, the interesting thing is that like nowadays I see people returning to them and I'll give you a clear really? example. From, really? uh, yeah, from Latin American, like young authors, like recently, like I think one of the most impressive books that were published this year was Fernanda Melchor's um, Hurricane Season, I believe it was translated by New Directions. Huh. Um, and she's like one of the most kind of like disruptive, like subversive new voices, experimental as well. And interestingly enough, when they when people ask her, who are your influences? She says, Garcia Marquez from, um, not from 100 Years of Solitude, but from The Autumn of the Patriarch. So that's oh, impressive yeah. that people that's are- That's a wonderful reading. book. I love yeah. that book. Extremely experimental, extremely Faulknerian, like, you know. It is, you're right. I never thought of that. Yeah, it so is. so it's interesting that we are now returning to to them, right? After yeah. that first kind of punk refusal to like, re, you know, yeah. like to acknowledge them as canonical figures. It's really interesting. I wonder who we in America are turning back to. I was quite surprised uh, a couple of weeks ago to watch um, six hours of Ken Burns' new film on Hemingway. Yeah. And he had not been in favor, I think, for a long time, but seems to be at least last week coming back. So I'm wondering who else. Yeah, exactly. Like, find. I'm, I'm thinking Baldwin, right? Like Ralph Ellis, son, like uh, so many of the authors that are kind of like coming back now, like. In yeah, an interesting Bald way. Baldwin has certainly resurfaced this year, yeah. which is interesting. He lived with us for a while. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, in Roxbury, he was our good friend. And we all were invited to the White House once together. And that's where we all met President Kennedy and oh. Robert Kennedy and all the families. And um, Jimmy Baldwin stayed very close to Bobby Kennedy. And they worked together. I wasn't part of that. But, uh, he, you know, once again, it's your home dinners <laughs> yeah, of course. because <laughs> he was the one that talked my husband bill styron into writing the confessions of nat turner in the first person and boy did bill get slammed for that <laughs> but anyway no thing. and the other the other anecdote that you told me about which is just like amazing is this uh, impressive anecdote with regards to neruda and with what how with regards to Neruda, Pablo Neruda, the, the Chilean poet, and how you were, when he dies in the middle of the, you know, Pinochet's coup, you're called oh. to Chile, <laughs> to, which could be like, you know, like a spy novel or something like that. Uh, so. Oh, that was funny. It was my first mission for Amnesty International, and it was to Chile during Pinochet's coup. And when Penn heard that I was going down, yeah, they asked me to, they heard that the poets, uh, you know, the famous poet who had just died of a heart attack, we think, uh, mm -hmm. under Pinochet, yeah. uh, had his um, last manuscript buried in the concrete uh, under a certain um, street corner. 
of course, I went nothing, <laughs> only, <laughs> only, you know, the smoothest possible stones on top. So I never did find those. Did but we had lots of adventures. Did anybody find it, or like? Is it no, like, is it no. Like, I don't know. I don't know how Penn managed to get this. They said his wife had buried it, and she said, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> so that wasn't just one of those rumors, but putting me in touch with the poets yeah. and their families. That's amazing. It's interesting because now, like hearing your like poetry, and particularly with regards to nature. I was thinking of Neruda, um, and I was I was interested in something that came out from your poetry, right? Like these like projections upon nature, right? Like for example, at one point you said, "Yes, it's beautiful, but it's not only beautiful, right? There's also like decay. There is climate change, and like I wanted to like ask you a little bit about that." Yeah, well, you can't forget what you know just because you're writing about your beautiful surroundings. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're lucky to have them, but. Oh, Neruda was, it was Neruda's poetry, of course, that I was supposed to be looking for and didn't find. But I certainly heard a lot <coughs> and learned a lot from other uh, Latin Americans, especially the Chileans who had been imprisoned by Pinochet because they'd been part of Allende's government and when they finally got to the u.s a few of them it was amazing to be with them and i remember one night in mexico city and gabo was there and so was carlos it was um a conference and after <clears throat> dinner i found myself sitting on the steps to some little restaurant and sitting next to me were um, Orlando Letelier mm -hmm. and Angel Para. And of course, Angel Para was a wonderful musician and poet. And the two of them began to sing songs to each other, which they had sung when they were imprisoned in Antarctica and taken out blindfolded every day and told they were going to be shot. And they weren't. And so at night they'd sing these songs to them. So, yeah. you know, which was, it didn't make up for Victor Hara yeah. being killed in the stadium, but yeah. it was something. No, and it's interesting that like, you know, Chile has such a strong tradition of poetry as well. And the like poetry seems to like play a particular role on these like sort of like hard times, right? Like, Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a way to have kind of private or personal truth in an age of public lying, yeah. which in America we we certainly are in now. Yeah. We thought we were out of it when we got rid of Trump, but we're not. Yeah. So. Yeah, now that you mentioned Victor Hara, I'm thinking like poetry has this like association also to music that like, and to song, right? That in the case of like Latin yeah. America also has like a big tradition, right? Like we have all of these, like we call them cantautores. They're like kind of singer songwriters, kind of Bob Dylan, right? The tradition de, of the song of protest, right? And I think that that became like very powerful in Latin America for a while. Yeah, that's true. Who are the Latin Americans now who you really value as as poets and musicians and uh, and, well, and prose writers? All of you, I'd like yeah. to know what the landscape of Latin America looks like now. I haven't been for years, unfortunately. Yeah, well, like you know, it's it's hard because it, there's so many, right? Like, so that we have so many different countries. But I'll speak basically for my two countries, right, which are often like kind of like, you know, they're small countries, so they are not like, they don't figure as often as Mexico or Argentina, right? I come from Costa Rica and Puerto Rico, we have each like populations of 4 million. So I'll say like, you know, in uh, the case of um, Puerto Rico, I love um, a great novelist who is uh, sadly unpublished, Marta Ponte, who is working with this like amazing kind of like, uh, 
you know, archival novels that relate to the colonial history of like Puerto Rico and like the old kind of like uh, plantation, like, um, yeah, setting. And in the case of uh, poetry, like, well, like we have here, like Claudia Acevedo, who I think like, you know, spoke the other day and like, I really, really love what she's doing. Uh, actually in English, right? So that's that's interesting to see that even at the level of language, some of us are writing in Spanish, some of us are writing in English. And in the case of uh, Costa Rica, I I really love like the stuff that a very young uh, novelist is doing. Uh, Byron Salas also untranslated and, and a little bit older, but uh, impressive as well is Carlos Cortez, who was very good friends with Sergio Ramirez as well in Nicaragua. So uh, just a couple of names to to open up, but there's so many others out there. That's really interesting. So what are you writing next now that you have this big, beautiful tome with the bird on the cover that <laughs> I have? <laughs> uh, well, I'm trying to like finish a new novel. Let's, let's see. It, was, it has been hard this year, of course. <laughs> because I, I I want to ask you as well like how how your writing is going but like for me it was hard like you know I told you that we have a toddler right so it, it was like hard for many other reasons besides COVID uh -huh. I, I think I'm getting there and indirectly it also touches upon questions of like nature and ruins right I think like my great kind of influence there was a German author W.G. Siebold who kind of oh. writes these beautiful novels uh, around like you know kind of natural history and so on what about you? What are you working on? Unfortunately, a memoir. <laughs> I don't know why. I always said I wouldn't do one, but I agreed to about a year and a half ago. And uh, so that's what I'm doing, and I'm trying to get to the end of it. Uh, well, I never would have written it if it hadn't been COVID quarantine time. Yeah, that's good. But I couldn't do my usual racing around the world or ignoring, <laughs> uh, you know, prose. So I've started to write it and I have an enormous detailed memory of my childhood, which I'm sure is going to be boring to everybody who reads it. And uh, I haven't gotten toward the last chapters and the epilogue of you know, looking back recently. But with all of, all of these anecdotes of Latin American dinners, you have to include them. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I do. <laughs> I, ha I, have a, I have a chapter on how that particular dinner led to us being, in, for my husband Bill and me, uh, and Arthur Miller uh, and his wife, who are our neighbors in Connecticut, we were invited by Castro to come to Cuba and have a dinner party with him, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> so I I've, I've written a chapter party. on impromptu dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a dinner with Castro, that's the real deal. That's, uh, well, it wasn't planned. We were, uh, our first night we were being um, fated, I would say, by a wonderful, um, a wonderful group and organization that was giving a dinner for uh, writers and artists to welcome us, really. Mm -hmm. And all of Castro's ministers were there and we were supposed to see Castro for dinner the next night, not our first night. Yeah. But I made the mistake of going to see a dissident in the afternoon, as I thought nobody would know. And of course, <laughs> they we did. And we were summoned after cocktails before dinner to come have dinner with Castro that night instead of waiting till the next night. And Garcia Marquez protested and all the ministers protested, but we had to go. He was the president. So we all went to this crazy dinner <laughs> uh, with President Castro. It was pretty interesting. So that is one chapter of my memoir. 
Yeah, like I think like the Cuban Revolution was central for Latin American literature, and like uh, it was it was a turning point, right, in the '60s when everybody was like, you know, at the beginning with Castro, then like people separated, and that kind of like led to like yeah. two divisions, right? Like for example, Vargas Llosa uh, and Gabo were always fighting over this point and stuff like that. But uh, it's definitely you were basically at the center of it all when well. it was all really happening pure chance you know <laughs> and it was as far as we were concerned it was all social but of course it wasn't it was very political yeah. and even our dinner which i thought was just social had been arranged uh, by uh actually initially clinton calling the president of mexico wow. and saying we just can't have all these um uh mexicans and other um latins uh <clears throat> coming to our shores in little boats and and a lot of them dying as this you know little boy had i mean he survived his mother died but anyway it was a fraught time yeah. and he wanted um president salinas of mexico to talk to his friend Castro and stop all the Cubans from coming. And President Salinas said to him, well, there'll be a, a quid pro quo, which of course there was, but apparently he called Castro and the two of them decided that they should send uh, Ga um, Garcia Marquez up as a go-between because he was our friend but he was still Castro's friend, even yeah. though he disagreed with him politically. Yeah. Uh, so that was the origin of our dinner party, which Bill and I had no idea about. <laughs> <laughs> all <of the> <laughs> until <laughs> afterwards, <laughs> until afterwards, when all sorts of things happen. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> anyway. um, I. I don't want to cut you off because your stories, Rose, are amazing. I yeah. I have to get invited to one of your dinner parties. Please save a seat at your table for uh, Carlos and I at your next dinner yeah, party. We'll, 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 we'll bring dessert. I love it. You tell me who you want to have there, and I'll dig their graves up for you. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, so we have a little bit of time left and um, a question here from Claudia. Um, so Claudia asks, um, could you talk about how you were able to keep distilling beauty from what we're currently living through? Um, and then she said, she asks, um, I'll, I'll get to the second one after that, but I guess start with that one. Um, Carlos, I think that's for you. Um, yeah, well, first of all, like, hi, Claudia, hola, hola, <laughs> um, yeah, um, first of all, like, so, so this novel was written before, right, everything that we are, like, living through, uh, but nonetheless, like, you know, I think that it's one of the things I always struggle with, like, for example, in, the t in terms of nature, right, and thinking about Costa Rica in particular, but also Puerto Rico, which you know very well, um, you know, in the case of Costa Rica, everybody always sees it as a paradise, right? Like a touristic paradise, you know, and, and there's always a danger that like we forget kind of like that it kind of obscures or it like blocks the politics behind it, right? So that's why I was like talking about all of these projections that we like, you know, project upon nature um, in terms of beauty and so on, like trying them not to like, you know, kind of cloud what, what is behind, right? And, and in natural history, that's a little bit what I do, right? Trying to trace both nature as this beautiful kind of yeah. garden, but at the same time, kind of like showing what seems to be historically be behind it. I don't know, in your case, Rose, if that's also how you deal with it. Huh. Wonderful. Um, and then let me see. And then she goes on to say, my other question is about the role of God in your work. Um, uh, she thinks Latinx writers are constantly grappling with this concept, especially if we were heavily influenced by Catholicism and um, Catholic uh, syncretism. Yeah, 
I think, you know, as a, as a good Jesuit boy that later converted into a Jewish <laughs> because of my wife, uh, I think God is ever present, right? And I think like, and, and most lately, like I think returning to Faulkner, there's always this kind of like God of the Old Testament type of tradition that like, it's not like a very good God, but rather like a God that like, kind of like Faulkner, like froze fire, like floods upon like the characters and they kind of need to survive. So. <laughs> Um, all right, thank you, Claudia. If anybody else has any other questions, click ask a question just below the stream. Um, now, uh, Rose, Lloyd Schwartz, he's um, at one of our speakers uh, or readers for next week. Um, he mentioned in the comments that there are few memoirs that he'd like to read more than yours. Um, and I would <laughs> thank you. I would I agree. have to agree with you. Ask, ask if he'd like me to help. Like to come and help me finish it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he'll help you. <laughs> I want to know who else have you had dinner with? What? Anybody else? Who else have you had dinners with? Anybody else that we know? Well, I imagine so, but I wouldn't know how to pull that apart. <laughs> it would have to be specific. You know, when you're as old as I am, you've known so many people. And yeah. my problem is that sometimes I, can't pull names up right away. I forget. Mm -hmm. And I went to a doctor and said, I'm really upset in the last couple of years. Um, I'm, you know, if I'm trying to write or tell a story or something, sometimes I can't remember the name right away. It's driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, well, clearly, you know, too many people. <laughs> <laughs> he was no help at all. <laughs> oh, but that's, goodness. That's what happens when you live a long life, and I've been very lucky. Very lucky. That's right. Um, all right. Well, I think that that is um, it for tonight. We don't have many questions, but um, I want to thank you both so much for um, being here with us for Right America um, and participating and putting yourselves out there and sharing your work with us. Um, it was definitely um Wonderful to have you. Uh, we are also thankful to everyone who have tuned in. Um, and also thank you so much to Roger Rosenblatt for putting um, Carlos and Rose together uh, this evening. It was so, so good to hear you guys. Uh, my, don't forget. <laughs> my question is, what made Roger decide to put the two of us together? <laughs> I don't know. He's just been doing, he's just done this where he's put the best people together. All of the conversations have been turning out so well. So I'm just so glad to be able to be here um, for all of this too. Um, but uh, don't forget to click the button right below the stream if you'd like to purchase uh, signed copies of uh, the books of our Write America authors. And um, we will see you right back here next Monday at seven o'clock for readings and conversation from Lloyd Schwartz and Priya Jane. So until oh. next time. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thank Thanks you. Bye. I'm going to bed with my hearing aids now. <laughs>